Good morning or good evening uh, to all of you, depending on where you are. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. We've had a, an excellent response. This is the kickoff of, and the first lecture of our food sustainability and public health uh, lecture series that is presented and organized by the Public Health Nutrition uh, Department um, at the School of Global Public Health. So uh, I am Niyati Parekh, I'm Associate Professor of Public Health Nutrition, and many of you have seen me uh, in the Nutritional Epi class, and I also teach Global Nutrition. My other role here is that I'm the Executive Director of the Doctoral Program, and it's my great pleasure to bring this series to you. I want to um, introduce our speaker for today, Melissa Metric. She's an NYU adjunct professor and she um, at the NYU Urban Farm, uh, she, she's the farm manager. Melissa was instrumental in establishing the NYU Urban Farm from scratch. I remember the days there was nothing there, Melissa, and it's become such a wonderful green space that's also an educational space for our community. And it's right here on campus. Most people don't even know that it exists. And I highly recommend uh, you go there and get your hands dirty in the, uh, you know, when she's harvesting, it's been a wonderful experience. Uh, she teaches a hands-on urban agriculture class where students do have the opportunity to partake in crop planning, harvesting, and implementing sustainable urban agriculture practices. Melissa has over a decade of experience in urban agriculture from volunteering with AmeriCorps to working at a school garden in South Berkeley to teaching children how to grow food at the Ruth Howe Family Garden at the New York Botanical Gardens. She was the garden manager at Roberta's, a popular farm-to-table restaurant dishing out wood-fired pizzas in Brooklyn, which I am told people come all the way back to New York to actually <laughs> eat, that, eat those pizzas, where she designed and created the on-site kitchen garden and uh, used to educate the chefs and guests in how to grow food sustainability within a city environment. She's a graduate of the master's program in food studies and also holds a horticulture certificate from Brooklyn Botanic Garden and is a master composter. On a personal note, I have known Melissa in the farm. Uh, I go there with my children and I've truly enjoyed spending time with her there. And every time I come back, I've learned at least five new things about food, harvesting, uh, various plants and their value, uh, even nutritional value. So without further ado, I, I want to turn to Melissa Metric and I thank her very much for being with us today and giving us the virtual experience. Um, and one day you guys will probably be able to go into the farm. Melissa. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you, um, Niyati. Um, it's been, it's really a pleasure to be here and to um, share the NYU Urban Farm Lab with everybody who's watching today. Um, I'm very sorry that we cannot do a physical tour of the farm due to COVID and all of, um, and safety measures and all these other things. Um, but I'm so happy to share the NYU Urban Farm Lab um, with everyone here. And it's really been a pleasure to work with uh, Niyati and have her visit the farm and everything else. So thank you, thank you. Remind everyone that this is a webinar format and unfortunately we can't see you, but we'll hold questions to the end and you can write the questions in the chat box and I'm going to be the moderator uh, in the question answer component of this uh, talk. Thank you, Melissa, please go ahead. Thank you, thank you. Um, so um, just like uh, Niyati said, um, I teach a class introduction to urban agriculture. Um, it is part of the nutrition and food studies department. I also manage the NYU urban farm lab and on the NYU urban farm lab. That is where the students um, can actually practice all the theories that they learn um, within the department within NYU in general. Um, it's an elective class. Um, which means students from all different departments can actually take the class. Um, right now we're doing it uh, virtually, we're doing it remotely, but it's still been really great. We're having students grow at home um, and kind of experimenting with all the ways they could grow in their apartments or in their backyards or um, terraces and things like that. Um, so without further ado, I'm just gonna uh, walk you through a brief virtual tour of the NYU Urban Farm Lab. 
It's located um, right behind the Silver Tower buildings on campus, on the NYU campus in New York City. So it's on um, Houston Street and Wooster, and it's right be behind 110 Bleecker Street, which is one of the um, Silver Tower buildings, which um, is faculty housing. So I will just start. So what is the NYU Urban Farm Lab? There's many different elements of the NYU Urban Farm Lab. So it's a classroom, it's um, a research space, it's many different things, and I'll kind of go through that. Um, before, so the NYU Urban Farm Lab, actually, it took around 10 years to get the land to actually have a farm. Um, the two people who are very, very important um, in getting the, the farm are Jenny Berg and Amy Bentley, who are within the Nutrition and Food Studies Department. They are the faculty who are um, behind the farm. And um, I work with them all the time just to kind of see what the, um, in managing the farm in general. So yeah, so the farm took about 10 years to get. It's actually on, um, it's on a, a historical land. So it was really hard to actually get access to that land, but we were so happy to finally get to it. Um, so that, like I stated before, the NYU Urban Farm Lab, it's a classroom, it's a community space. Um, we produce um, food for the NYU Food Lab, which is the kitchen that is a part of the Nutrition and Food Studies Department. So that's where students can actually take um, classes on knife skills and actually learning how to cook certain foods and things like that. And then it's also for research. So we love having students um, come to the NYU Urban Farm Lab and actually practice research. So um, we would, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about all of this. Um, okay, so um, the NYU Urban Farm Lab as a classroom, again, I teach an introduction to urban agriculture class, and we kind of go over everything. It's an introductory class, but it's really to just um, teach students how to grow food. But it, so we're, we're teaching them from how to, from sowing those seeds to harvesting those seeds. And now um, one of the new things that we're starting to implement is actually saving seeds. And we start, we're starting to talk about seed ethics and where our seeds are coming from and all of these other things. Um, we also talk about um, thinking of the farm as a whole ecological space, the ecology of the farm. Um, we mostly practice, or we don't mostly, we practice natural farming or organic farming. Um, and so the ecology of the farm is very important in that within our techniques. Um, and so we have to be aware of um, everything from soil nutrients to plant health to um, how many insects and microbes and everything else are actually around the farm in the soil, things like that. Um, and you can see in these pictures, again, from seed to harvest. So um, what we do with a lot of the harvest is actually the students who are growing those crops can then take those crops home. But we also use the harvest in other ways too, and I'll talk about that as well. Um, so the NYU Urban Farm Lab is also a community space. We have volunteer days, we have farm work days. Right now, um, we have kind of put a hold on a lot of this um, just because of safety measures. So it's been a little bit tricky to um, do proper forms of um, the six feet apart kind of safety spacing within the farm. Um, but um, the farm as a community space we actually, about a quarter of the farm is for the residents who live in the Silver Tower buildings. So we break those up into, we break that space up into plots and then the um, residents can kind of sign up for a plot and then they could farm that throughout the whole season. Also, there's a nursery school on the first floor. You see this building right here. That's a Silver Tower buildings. This first floor is actually um, UPNS which is University Plaza Nursery School, and they also have a plot. So the little, little tiny children can also come out and um, start growing food as well, which is really 
always super sweet and lovely to see. And also I um, guide the residents if they would like, um, if they would like guidance in growing their crops, um, I also help with guidance in that as well. Um, so part, so also we have the NYU student club plots. So the nutrition and food studies department has um, three or four clubs. And so we love to have the clubs actually have their own plot on the farm. I meet with them about once a week. Um, and then they grow whatever crops that they want that they feel are important to their club's mission. Um, so again, and, and also um, before COVID, I would love to have, or we would all love to have the cl clubs all meet one evening together a week or something like that. So also all the clubs can actually meet each other and share harvests and just learn how to grow food together. Um, uh, another section of the farm is the NYU Urban Farm Lab and the Study Abroad section. So within the Nutrition and Food Studies Department, um, we also have study abroad classes. Um, right now, those may be very limited, um, but uh, for example, here, um, we had some, um, we had some um, students go to Cuba, we had some students go to Berlin, we had some students go to China, um, to certain locations and things like that. So what we do is we have, we love to invite the students who actually go on these study abroad classes, go on these courses, um, figure out what was the produce that they saw within these places, and then try to grow that produce if we can in this climate. And so then the students have access to this produce and then hopefully they will be able to actually recreate some of those dishes and some of that experience. So that is actually the goal of the study abroad. So um, I remember um, when Amy Bentley's class went to Berlin, um, we grew potatoes and we grew kohlrabi and we grew horseradish. I never grew horseradish before. So that was really interesting. Um, and beets and all the things that you would find kind of within that cuisine. Um, so that was really fun. Uh, and then um, also we, um, a lot of our produce will go the, to the NYU food lab. So within those kitchen classes, we actually sometimes have the kitchen managers come to the farm, harvest um, some of the crops. So when they have an herbs class and um, the students are learning about all these different herbs, right? We love to be able to provide them with five different varieties of basil so that they could actually see that there is more than just Genovese or sweet basil. So there's, you know, sweet basil, there's purple basil, there's holy basil, there's lemon lime basil, there's cinnamon basil, um, Thai basil. So, um, so that is one of the implements as well. And also we, we really push our students to kind of show off um, what are the dishes that they're making with the crops that they're getting from the farm lab. I mean, it is, um, it, uh, the NYU Urban Farm Lab is accessible to all NYU, but it is also um, kind of supported by the Nutrition and Food Studies Department. So we want our students to show what is the food that they're making, right? So, um, and also the cultural implications of these dishes that they're making. Where are these dishes coming from? What's the history of these dishes? Um, th those types of things as well. And then um, one of the last things that we do is we also do student research. Um, so we love having both undergrad and grad students do research on the farm. Um, so in this picture right here, uh, Magdalena, was actually doing research on um, cover crops, but also grains. So she wanted to plant certain crops that you grow specifically for grains. Um, you could see in this background in the middle picture, that's amaranth in, the foref in, in this um, forefront, that's actually buckwheat. And then she also grew teff, which is um, used as a flower within Ethiopian food. And so she wanted to actually get the grains from these crops and then turn those crops back into the soil and put nutrients back into the soil. Um, so use it as a cover crop as well. Um, so um, we love kind of having students push to do research on the farm 
Um, we are very, very open to that. So if any students are interested in doing that, we would love to have more research on the farm in general. Um, and then one other thing that we do, we do so many things, uh, we started working with the Regional Green Project. So that is bringing back local grains actually to the East Coast, to the Northeast in general. Um, upstate New York, especially around the Finger Lakes, used to be um, a huge area of production of grains. Um, and so there's been this new local movement to actually bring back local grains. Um, and we also like to grow different grains um, or try to bring back older varieties of grains to get our biodiversity back up within our cereal grains. So for example, we started growing einkorn, this picture right here, um, and these seeds. Einkorn is one of the oldest wheats within civilization. So this is like a thousand years old, this variety. Um, and so we actually got to grow that on Housen Street in the, in the middle of New York City, and it was really exciting. And then we could also um, share it with our students. So when Jetty Berg or Amy Bentley are teaching the food history um, class, they could take the students to the farm and show them einkorn, that this was a cornerstone of creating civilization, this wheat, this variety. Um, so it's really kind of special to kind of show students that. Um, and educate them and that they could actually see the grain growing because how many of us in New York City or any other urban areas we actually get to see these grains growing usually they're in you know the Midwest or something like that with field acres and acres of this grain and we just don't really get to experience that um, so yeah so not only are we teaching students about it but we're also keeping these varieties alive by growing them and also educating about them. Um, and then, so the big question is, how do we continue the farm lab during COVID? Um, it has definitely been tricky, but we've gotten really, really resourceful um, in teaching the introduction to our urban agriculture class. It's actually been, not actually, but it's been really fun because in teaching it remotely, we get to see all, all of the students who are in the class, there's three sections of the class, we get to see um, their, their environments. We get to see where they would be growing from home, right? So usually when you're on the NYU Urban Farm Lab, we show them all these different techniques and practices for um, on the farm. But when they're at home, we could show, we could actually test out how much light do they get? Is it, do they need to get grow lights? Um, how are they watering it? Do they have cats that are gonna like knock their plants down and stuff like that? And how do they, how can they kind of put everything in a safe place? Um, or what are the varieties if they are, let's say in California or if they are in Taipei or if they are in somewhere else, how are their growing conditions gonna be different from New York City? And how are they gonna figure out how to grow there? So it's been really fun to kind of share our experiences wherever we are in our growing spaces and how to kind of, um, how to grow where we are, which I, which is, it's been, it's been great. Like I remember the summer class, we had one student who was in, or who was in um, Oregon and she had, um, you know, cherry trees and all of these other trees that were just in her backyard. And so she got to share that with us. We also had a student who was in Brooklyn who already planted his whole backyard as a farm. And so we would kind of walk through his backyard and see what he was growing and see what issues he had and things like that. So we've definitely kind of um, altered the class, but it's still been really fun. And then also I do videos on the farm. So I still do these instructional videos on the farm um, and, and that as well. So one other thing that we did that we have started um, with a grad student, Lee Ullman, who's in the Nutrition and Food Studies grad program, um, she came to the farm and asked if we had a seed library. And we were already kind of thinking about how important it is to save seed and kind of um, really work on the biodiversity of seed. Um, and so we, she kind of asked us if we'd be interested in starting an NYU seed library. And of course we were very um, interested in it. 
Um, and so we did a pilot program this summer where we had about 30 participants. We sent them three varieties of um, seeds and then we did kind of like a monthly meetup kind of webinar to show them how to actually grow out those crops and save those seeds. And then hopefully they will send, um, we're still not done with a pilot yet, but they'll send those seeds back to us and we will keep them. And also if they wanna keep some of those seeds, that's totally fine too. So what we would love to do is um, have more and more students learn how to save seeds, um, keep some of them for themselves, and then also start creating this library at the NYU Urban Farm Lab where we have all these different varieties of seeds, but that were either grown on the farm or these other locations. So again, it's um, us doing the work within, um, within creating or keeping biodiversity within our food supply, um, which is very, very important. Um, and I think, so before we get to questions about the NYU Urban Farm Lab, um, Niati, I'm, I'm just about done. So we will definitely take questions about the NYU Urban Farm Lab. But um, Niati, if you have some questions in general, um, let's see if um, Niati is, um, okay. Well, okay, so um, also one thing that I didn't mention is that the NYU Urban Farm Lab has a Instagram. And so um, um, if you would like to follow us, that would be great. We could show you what's going on at the NYU Urban Farm Lab. We've started to do some um, kind of live videos on Instagram. Um, and we would like to do a lot more of those to actually give um, farm tours and things like that via Instagram. And then if any of you have any questions, um, you could always email me at mnm312 at nyu.edu. Um, and yes, um, and I would be happy to answer any of your questions. If there's more questions um, after, um, after the q and I'm sure a lot of you are going to have questions. We already had some great questions come in that I'll be happy to answer. So thank you very much for that. And um, I want to start with some questions about how, how urban farming is related to public health nutrition. Of course, you've spoken a lot about that. But what's its role in community health? I'm just trying to bring it back home to public health nutrition. Yeah, sure. So. Um, there's a lot of ways where urban agriculture is tied to um, public health and community health and things like this. I would say uh, probably one of the largest ways that it's connected is actually um, food access, right? So if you have these community gardens um, within these certain areas in urban, in urban locations that don't have a lot of access to fresh fruits and vegetables, um, it's a way that um, populations and communities can have access to um, fresh fruits and vegetables, right? Um, I think uh, another thing that not many people mention is that for those community members who are doing urban, who are practicing urban agriculture, they are also exercising. They are also doing physical labor. Um, it's actually, you know, it's a lot of work to be a part of a garden to kind of till or not till the soil, um, to plant, to do all this work. Um, so, and I would, one other thing that maybe isn't necessarily nutrition based, but also just health wise, um, the actual, the psychological benefits, right? Of being out in nature, connecting to nature, kind of taking a breather for a minute. Um, seeing all of the life that is within the garden or the farm. And also just the idea of being self-sustenant. Um, this idea of growing your own food, of not being so um, dependent of, um, you know, just dependent on the larger food system in general. And also that um, within certain neighborhoods, you know, you might have to travel an hour or two to go to a supermarket or to get fresh produce. So having it literally in your backyard, um, I think is another kind of great aspect. So I would just say um, food accessibility 
as having access to fresh produce is a, is a huge, um, yeah, is a huge step. Thank you. I'm also going to look at the chat, but uh, I have two more questions before that. Uh, how is urban farming related to climate change? Yeah, so that's a great question. So um, there's many, many different ways that urban farming is related to climate change. Um, I would say one of the ways is that in urban areas, there is heat island effect, which is since we are surrounded by cement, um, by these tall buildings, um, in urban areas, it's actually a lot hotter um, because all of that cement absorbs the heat. The tall buildings keep airflow from coming from going in and out of urban areas. Um, and then also all the buildings are creating heat. So a lot of times in urban areas, it's a lot hotter. So when you're actually putting these green spaces in urban areas, it's helping it cool down. Um, it is also these, these little green spaces also help with all of the life within urban areas. We don't think about the ecosystem of urban areas, but there's actually a lot of wildlife here and also all the life that migrates through. So right now there's a huge, um, this is migrating season for birds. So we have so many birds that fly over, that fly through New York City. So we're actually creating these ecosystems for, um, for all of this wildlife. Um, last thing um, with, there's the other environmental impacts. So for example, when you have a rooftop farm, that actually um, can possibly decrease the energy use of those buildings because you are insulating that building more. So it's not going to have to produce as much heat or do as much cooling and things like that. Also rooftop farms in these green spaces can keep water from going directly into our water source. So um, New York City in general has a dual system. So every time it rains over an inch, um, our all of our rainwater um, goes into our sewage system and then it overflows and it could go directly into our waterways. So um, the more green spaces you have, the more those green spaces are going to absorb that water. Um, and it's not and it's going to keep it from going into our waterways, which if you like swimming, you know, that could be an issue. So um, so there's many different, um, different aspects. And also, yeah, just like um, biodiversity in general in urban areas is really important. And that really leads me into the next question about how urban farming is related to food systems. I think we learned some serious lessons during COVID. Uh, so if you could speak to food systems in general and also COVID. <laughs> yeah, I would say, um, so one of the things that, um, I really think the impact of urban agriculture and food systems is a access, right? That in urban areas, you actually have access to fresh produce. Um, B, it also, um, when you're teaching urban agriculture in these urban areas, you're teaching these techniques. And then hopefully who is ever learning these techniques will start wondering, well, when I go to the supermarket, what kind of techniques are they using? Um, what is the, what is conventional produce? Um, what are the techniques that are used with that? Are they, is that good for the environment? Is that good for, you know, the food that we're eating or that we're ingesting, right? Is there going to be a lot of chemical pesticides and fertilizers? Um, are they doing monocrops, right? So when you're actually teaching these techniques in urban areas, hopefully that will um, make the person, whoever is learning about these techniques, whenever they go and they get food, how was this actually grown? How, what is the food system that, um, this produce, that this produce is a part of? And in me buying this produce, what am I supporting, right? So what farmers am I supporting? Um, what companies am I supporting? Um, what, you know, uh, Am I supporting local farmers? Am I supporting local seed growers? Am I, you know, or am I supporting these larger pharmaceutical companies and chemical companies and things like that? So I think that's kind of a huge aspect of it that, that and also just the idea of what is in season, right? How far is my produce traveling um, to get to me? Um, and just more about you know, our food and our crops in general. And also kind of like, you know, growing food can be a little bit tricky. So it's also just 
it, it also just shows, you know, the, how, the idea of, of how much work farmers put into it um and and just what that work is in general um so yeah thanks i, I have about uh, 11 questions and i'm going to go through as many as i can I yes you have plenty of time so that's, yes we have a lot there were three questions that were sent beforehand uh and i'm going to and one was from sarah bond who's a nyu graduate student and the question is can you speak to the relationship between soil health food quality and nutrition. Um, of course, I, I'm going to read out all the questions. If you feel that you've answered something, you can uh, decide how to go about it. I am sorry, the question is not over. I'm learning more about the effects of soil degradation on the diversity of our food supply. And I'm curious to hear how local urban farms are combating possible problems. Yes, um, so that is definitely a great question. Um, so within organic farming or natural farming, um, uh, farmers definitely focus on soil health. Soil health is the key in growing pretty much all produce, right? Because if you have a living soil, that means all of these organisms are within the soil. Um, that is the baseline of your ecosystem of your farm. When you have a dead soil, um, that is when you have to put all of these resources into the soil, um, which um, can be very bad for the environment, right? So the whole idea is to use less resources, have a lot of biodiversity in your soil, and then in effect, that will make your plants healthier because you have a healthier ecosystem in general and stronger plants. Um, so the end also you will have um, more food, right? So if you're not struggling in growing your plants because you have healthy soil, then your plants are going to be healthier, you're going to have a higher yield, that type of thing. Now, a huge um, issue within urban areas is that we can have um, heavy metals within our soil, specifically lead, right? So the key is to A, test your soil first. That's the, the key in general, if you're growing in soil and there's other um, techniques where you're not growing in soil like hydroponics or aquaponics that um, a lot of farmers in urban areas are starting to use. Um, but the key is to first test your soil, see if there's heavy metals in it. Um, if it's at a certain level, there's a certain like safety level um, that um, you can still kind of grow in, like you could grow um, fruit trees and other things like that. The, the more it's off the ground, usually the safer it is. But there's also different techniques that um, you could keep that, that kind of helps you not have exposure to that heavy metals in those soils. Um, so kind of in answering that question, the key is the more healthier your soils are, the more um, healthier your plants are gonna be. Um, and I cannot speak on this because I have not done research on this, but possibly um, the more nutritious your plants are going to be. Um, but again, I have not done research on this, so I, I, I don't feel like I should answer that question. But um, yeah, just the general health and ecosystem of the farm is really important, but the first steps are knowing what's going on with your soil and with your farm or your garden. And then taking the right steps to keep yourself from giving, getting heavy metal poisoning and things like that. And also um, to keep your, um, your, your food kind of safe. And you may have answered this question already, uh, but this is from Kate Chen, an NYU undergrad student. How does COVID-19 impact urban farming? Yeah, that's so um, there was definitely a rise in um, in people being interested in farming in general during COVID-19 and also in gardening in their home and things like that. Um, usually during times of crisis or during times of scarcity, especially in urban areas, more people are going to want to grow food because they're not sure about their food supply and all these other things. So I would say definitely people have become more interested in it. I would say um, the one thing that a lot of folks are worried about um, is how to keep that interest going, right? So um, are as many people going to be interested in it in a year? 
So with seed sales in general, they were up 300% because of COVID. Um, and that puts a huge pressure on seed companies, especially small seed companies. And what are people doing with those seeds, right? So um, the, the, the other kind of worry that I have is um, taking all of these resources and actually using those resources instead of just depleting those resources. So keeping that interest going, um, kind of putting that time aside to keep watering your plants on your terraces and things like that, um, to keep interested in it. Like what are these new crops that I want to grow that I'm really interested that I'm going to use on a weekly basis, right? I might not try to grow the hardest crop in the world. I might start out with radishes and then it's really easy. It takes a month or something like that. And then I have my crop, right? So, um, so I would say that's kind of very, very important of just um, being aware of the resources that you're using once you start getting into this. And also how do you keep interested in it? But it also has had a huge impact on um, on also like food banks and things like that and community organizations that are um, putting out um, there the, in New York City, there's been the the it's like the food refrigerators. I don't know, Niati, if you've heard of this, but in certain neighborhoods, certain community organizations have put out refrigerators outside their stores and um, certain urban farms or certain organizations will donate food to these refrigerators every week and then the community can actually take from these refrigerators which i think is kind of you know a genius plan and it's a way that the community could um, support itself and support each other which is super super important right so if anything it, it's great that it's gotten people more interested in growing produce um, but I think, I think the thing is, is that how do we keep that interest going in general, right? Uh, the two more questions that were sent beforehand and then another 10 on the chat. So I'm, I'm sort of uh, watching the time as well. This is from Edward Atkin uh, from Wagner College, not affiliated with NYU. What vegetables grow well in an urban garden? And, yes. and, and sorry, and, the, and another question by Peter, who's an NYU faculty, Peter Terazakis. Do you have student uh, uh, programs for student in involvement, which you've sort of asked? Yeah, so, um, so I'll answer the first question. Uh, I'll answer the, um, what can you grow within an urban environment? So, you know, that could be, that's kind of tricky because it depends on your growing space, right? So if you're growing in an apartment, the varieties that I would set, suggest for you to grow can be, excuse me, very different than if you're growing on a terrace or in a backyard or something like that. So the first thing that I suggest everybody to do is look at their growing space. How much light do they get? How much space do you have? What is your knowledge in general, right? And then maybe what I would say, since in urban areas, um, and especially growing indoors, we don't have tons of light. Um, what I first have my students do is actually start growing sprouts in their home, which are little, little baby greens. I have them start off growing radish sprouts and in growing it on their windowsill, then they could see how much light do they have? Are your sprouts reaching towards the light? Um, so that's a little test crop. And once you start testing um, what kind of conditions you have or how much time you have to, you have to actually take care of this, then I would move up to the next step of like baby greens or herbs or, you know, something that you don't need a lot of space for that can deal with low light. So usually I suggest, you know, leafy greens and also herbs, things that are a little bit tougher. I might hold off on getting the raspberry plant or asparagus plant that, you know, takes three years to harvest. So, um, yeah, so first the key is figuring out what kind of growing space you have. And then once you figure that out, what crops would work best in that growing space. So if I have a backyard that's totally shady, I'm not gonna grow tomato plants there because they love full sun, right? So, or if I wanna grow, let's say a tomato plant in my apartment, I'll probably get a grow light and get a really big container that I, I could fit it in and things like that. So it's, you know, it all depends on your growing space, how much time you have, 
the knowledge that you have. And also, last thing, I would really suggest crops that you eat on a weekly basis. You're not going to take care of it um, if you don't really have a use for it, right? So if you're actually, if you use baby greens on a weekly basis and you get it, you know, in those boxes that kind of go bad in three days, it makes more sense for you to grow it yourself. And then you'll actually be using it and have a reason to go check up on it on a, like every day or on a weekly basis or something like that. Um, and then um, for the NYU Urban Farm Lab, we do, so what, um, hopefully, not hopefully, but when we are not in a time of a pandemic, we have volunteer days, we have for students and for the NYU community in general. Um, we ask everybody um, to, you could email me at mnm312 at nyu.edu and I can put you on the volunteer list and um, we send out emails whenever we have volunteer days. Um, uh, when there isn't a pandemic, we usually have volunteer days about twice a month, sometimes um, we do a weekly volunteer day. It kind of changes depending on the season. Um, and then we also do events. So usually we have a harvest event. It would be probably right around this time where we invite the community to come and actually harvest from the farm. So um, that's also really fun. Or we have a big spring planting day. So we definitely like to get um, the community involved in the farm. But it's been a little tricky because of COVID. So we're trying to just do many, you know, kind of virtual tours and things like that for the community. I'm thank you so much. I'm switching to the chat questions. And okay. for those of you who have asked multiple questions, I'm going to make some choices so that everybody's questions have, everyone gets a chance to ask. The first question is from Yanis, who's asked, can we arrange middle school or high school visits? Of course, uh, not during COVID. And uh, her other question uh, was, who determines how tasty the produce is, especially tomatoes? So if you can answer <laughs> Yes, the, those are good questions. Um, so yes, we, we've actually had um, middle school students visit. We've had high school um, students visit. Over the summer, um, we did this program where we were, one of my students um, in the Intro to Urban Agriculture class, she actually worked with the Boys and Girls Club of Harlem. Um, and so we were actually all of our since we weren't having classes on the farm and we had all this produce we started donating our produce um, to the Boys and Girls Club um, where my student was actually doing a training program for students in middle school and high school where they could then send out that produce um, so um, to their community. So we were actually donating a bunch of produce to the Boys and Girls Club. So we do definitely have these relationships and these connections to certain organizations. Um, and we also had the World Science Fair come visit. So students from the World Science Fair, we did a tour with them and we were teaching them about um, the effects of climate change and also how urban agriculture is um, involved in that. Um, one of the things that I actually didn't mention throughout that question was also the idea of the more um, perennial plants you have, or the more green spaces you have, the more carbon that you're sequestering into the soil. So that's another effect of climate change, of trying to get that carbon out of the environment and into the soil. And that's just one of the things we we're talking about in the um, World Science Festival. So I would say if, um, if you're a teacher and you would love for your class to visit the farm, we do do tours. Um, feel free to email me um, and hopefully, you know, I don't know when, when we'd be able to do a tour in person in the future, um, but we are definitely open to that. Um, and then uh, for who determines what tomatoes are the tastiest, it, you know, it all depends on your palate. I, that's why it's kind of interesting, you know, you could have five people taste five different tomatoes, do a taste test. And everybody's taste buds can be different. You know, that all depends on what kind of tomatoes you grew up around, what are the certain, you know, um, cultures that you're from and the taste that you're used to and all those other things. So I would say um, just, you know, it's to each its own. <laughs> we have Hopefully a that's a good answer. Uh, 
we have a uh, really good question from Sarah Bond, who's asking um, uh, more about seed ethics. And if you have articles to recommend uh, at, at late, you know, after this, we can send it over to whoever's interested. Our yes, um, definitely. I, um, I have a bunch of articles and readings and things like that. So yes, I could definitely give those resources. But could you speak a bit to seed ethics? Yeah, so seed ethics. Um, you know, seed ethics have been kind of important in um, for a really, really long time. Um, and one might ask, what is seed ethics, right? So um, there used to be many, many um, seed companies. Seed companies used to be, um, and also local farmers used to save their own seeds. And that is pretty much, you know, really not prevalent anymore. And the main reason is because very large seed companies have slowly bought out um, the small scale seed company um, and also kind of um, more farmers kind of became reliant on these larger seed companies. Um, the issue with that is that 60% of our seed sales, I think it was in 2018 or 2019, um, were by um, just, I think, three companies. It might be four companies. So four companies are getting 60% of the seed sales, and that means that they, um, you know, own many of our seeds that are edible crop seeds. The issue with that is who are these companies? A lot of them are ph pharmaceutical chemical companies. Um, and if they have certain practices like monocropping and things like that, um, we are gonna have a lot less biodiversity within our, um, within our seeds, within our edible crops. Um, and with climate change and all of these other issues that are coming about, we are gonna need biodiversity more than ever because we're gonna need our crops to be able to adapt. And the less biodiversity you have, the less adaptation you have. Um, so there has been this really big push to, um, in the sense of biodiversity. And then also when you come to seed ethics, um, who were the um, who were the people who were the cultures who started these varieties and um, and giving them not only credit but um, you know but a lot of times it's it's not it's not spoken about of where these varieties actually came from who created these varieties um, and 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 where these varieties should be right so who has ownership i think a huge um point of it is ownership of these certain varieties and patents and things like that um so that is also the idea of behind um seed ethics so kind of bringing all of these to light and just transparency within our seeds within um, seed companies seed businesses in general where are these seeds coming from um, and who are we supporting in buying these seeds? Thank you so much. Uh, the next question is from Danica uh, Lang. You mentioned it took 10 years to establish the NYU Urban Farm. Um, do you see this success as paving the way for establishing additional urban farm spaces across the NYU campus? And a related question was um, if other campuses have these efforts. Yes, so um, so we would. Uh, I, I think we would love we would love to expand. I feel like that is more of an Amy Bentley, Jenny Berg question because uh -huh. since they are the directors of the farm, um, and they were the ones who kind of really got this project off the ground. They are still the backbone of the project. Um, but I know that um, George Ray's, who does NYU grounds, what he's trying to do is um, kind of put more edible crops within the NYU grounds in general. So that is um, a big thing that he's kind of pushing. Um, right now we have the NYU Urban Farm Lab. I mean, we would love to expand, um, but I think that's, that's still kind of, you know, we'll see what happens in the future. Um, and then there's also, there is another space that's um, the, the NYU Garden Club. So they have a space as well. Um, and initially the NYU Urban Farm Lab was kind of within that space and then we got access to our own space. 
by the silver tower buildings. So, um, so yeah, I, I think we'll, we'll kind of see what happened. And yes, there is actually um, many, um, many universities, many um, city colleges and things like that, that have their own farms as well. Um, so I'm trying to think, I think King's, King's College might have, um, King's Community College um, might have their own urban farm. Um, I, yeah, I think there's a couple of them that have um, their own urban farm. So I would definitely, if you're going to another college or another school, check that out um, and see if, you know, they, and, and push to make it happen because it's, it's such a incredible um, kind of, uh, it's, it's just an incredible thing to have on a campus um, to learn how to do. Yeah. I'm jumping around the order to make sure that, um, that different people get a chance to ask questions. Uh, we have about five minutes and uh, at least eight questions. So Sonia's question is next. How do you balance the fact that often the most underserved uh, communities in terms of food justice, local food, ethically grown food, uh, are black and brown communities and in the other boroughs? Um, and the fact that the garden is in lower Manhattan? Um, so that's, that's a really great question. So um, I feel like the, um, so one of the things that we also do in the class is we actually, um, when it was pre-pandemic, um, we would actually visit many community gardens and farms throughout the different boroughs, right? And there's also many, many um, community gardens in farms within these specific locations, especially um, of um, black and brown populations, right? So um, they, so it's kind of interesting. One of the things that I teach within, um, within the class and the history of urban agriculture is um, many urban gardeners and urban farmers um, are, you know, it's are, from these populations, right? So um, they, so many communities have, um, you know, that is the idea of self-sustenance, of access. And I think the key is to, um, where we kind of play a role is for, um, for me to bring my students to these locations, to support these locations. Um, and also just the idea of um, you know, listening to urban farmers, listening to community gardens. What are the resources that they need? What are they asking for? Um, how can you, how can one um, support these, um, these initiatives, right? And um, do they need volunteers? Maybe they don't need volunteers. Maybe, you know, so I think it's, it's a educating, um, you know, my key role is education. Right, so I think that's the idea of first um, bringing my students to these certain community gardens and um, learning about the history, learning about um, the perspectives, um, these communities that are really doing amazing work and they have been doing amazing work for, you know, since urban areas have started, right? And just kind of, um, not only acknowledging, but um, supporting and also giving the platform to um, these amazing people and groups who have been doing this for a very, very long time. That is a part of um, the history of urban agriculture and the present day of urban agriculture. Um, hopefully that kind of answers that question a little bit. Thank you. Uh, we have two related questions and it's about composting. One is from Danica Lam. Are you composting on site? If not, where are the inedible organic outputs of the farm going? And the other one is also about composting. But actually, before we go to that, you know, uh, Melissa, you also do a lot of donations and you harvest uh, to, to, to give the boxes to the communities. And I think that sort of relates to the previous question too. <laughs> Yeah, have. yeah, and I think it's also the idea of um, you know teaching um, teaching students um, who will then share their or not share their knowledge, but many of my students um, might be from you know it's like I'm from New York City, 
um, a lot of my students can be from New York City or from other urban areas, sharing these techniques and then um, students kind of going and starting their own, own organizations, um, working within their community, knowing who their community members are and what they actually want, right? So that's a huge one as well. Um, but yes, yeah, we did start doing um, donations, but I think the key is um, not donations. I think the key is um, self-sustainability and, um, and, and um, you know, just giving support, listening, giving support where it's needed and that type of thing. Um, yeah. Um, oh, so oh, and then compost, compost. sorry, compost. Um, so yes, so uh, we do have a three bin system um, on the farm. So we have been, uh, we actually, um, one of the residents built it this summer. Um, and so it's kind of amazing that we have a three bin system. We also have a tumbler. I did um, take the master composting um, course within, it's part of Brooklyn Botanic Gardens and um, New York City Department of Sanitation. And it is an excellent course. So I suggest if anybody really wants to get into composting, you should take this. Um, amazing teachers. Um, and also you have to volunteer 30 hours and, and um, work within the composting world within, if you're in New York City, within New York City. Um, and so yeah, composting is key because that is what is putting life back into your soil. And that is also what is keeping it a closed loop system, right? So um, yes, we definitely do composting on the farm. Um, and I love, you know, teaching students about it. Thank you. And we have time for the last question before we um, end today's uh, lecture. How many kinds of crops are we currently growing in the farm? And maybe if you can give a breakdown on what types of crops they are. Yeah, there's a lot of different crops. So um, we grow everything from, you know, tomatoes to like horseradish to potatoes to eggplants to you know, we grow kale, we grow collard greens, we grow, you know, um, we grow edamame or soybeans, we grow black eyed peas. So we, the, the key is, is that we grow many, many, many different varieties because it's an educational space. Um, and because it's part of the nutrition and food studies department, we study a lot about food and culture. So we love to grow as many varieties as kind of possible. Um, uh, because it's also almost like um, not only to teach the students about these varieties and how to grow them, but also that it is kind of a, a like a signifier. It's like a signal of like, oh, some students can be from certain cultures and they'll see this variety growing and they're like, oh, you're growing this variety. I know how to use that. And then they'll kind of share the dish that they use it with and all these other things. So, and also from a, um, from a health perspective, the more um, varieties you grow, the more biodiversity you have on the farm and the more, um, the better ecosystem you have on the farm. So um, the more beneficial insects that we'll get that will take care of our pest insects and things like that. Um, so, and the more pollination we have and everything else. So there's multiple kind of um, reasons to grow. Yeah, all the different varieties that we do. Thank you ever so much. I'm, I'm really appreciative of your time always, and I've enjoyed my personal time with you on the farm. I also want to acknowledge and thank Amy Bentley and Jenny Berg, who've been so generous with that space with us, and really, we, we've still kept the connection over the farm. I think the best part is to um, learn something about those vegetables, take them home and cook with it. It's just fresh and wonderful, and uh, hopefully one day we can um, all get together on the farm again. Thank you so much for the, those who stayed right up to the end. I think we had a great response uh, today. Please stay tuned and join us uh, for our next lecture in November. We'll, come to, uh, we'll um, send out details that, and they're forthcoming. So thank you very, very much. Okay, thank I think you, we're getting Melissa. some great thank you notes yes. in the chat, uh, Melissa, and I'm sure that people will email you after this. Yes, thank you so much for everybody for joining and thank you, Nuyati. Okay. Pleasure. Thank you. Bye bye.